Amen. You all may be seated. Good morning. For those of you that don't need, know me, my name is, uh, I'm Pastor Jeremy. I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, it's, uh, it's good to see you all this morning. It's good to see you all this morning. And uh, as we begin our next uh, sermon series, we're going to be, as you can see, our sermon series is going to be on the book of Ruth. So if you have your Bibles, keep them open to the book of Ruth. We're going to stay there for the next five weeks. We're going to stay there today. But as you may have noticed, we, we, we're going to do things a little bit different this morning. As you see, we got the communion played out in front of us. Uh, and so what we're going to do this morning is we're going to start, I'm going to do a quick little jump into the text that was just read, and we're going to wade into it briefly. And then we're going to stop. We're going to have a prayer of confession. We're going to get our hearts right with God and with one another. And then we're going to partake in the bread of life. We're going to partake in the communion that we see right here. And then after the communion, we're going to take some time to sing and give praise to the Lord for what he did for us. And then after a couple songs, we're going to get back in and we're going to dive back into the book of Ruth. So I know I'm shaking things up a little bit today, but does that sound good to everybody? All right, we're going to try something a little bit different today. But uh, if you still have your Bibles open, let's begin exactly where the narrative began. Let's begin right at the beginning with a man named Elimelech. I always like that name, Elimelech, Elimelech, and us. But uh, Elimelech and his wife Naomi and their two sons, fleeing from trouble, fleeing from hardship. So the story begins with a group of people leaving, I want you to understand, the land of promise in search of a better or more secure life. You could say they're searching for greener pastures. So, with, with all that said, as we just read, what is the reason, and this is a question to you guys, what is the reason for Elimelech and, his, and Naomi and their family to leave Bethlehem? What was the reason given in the text? Good, famine. So, all right, a cup of coffee is working today. Famine, very good. Famine, okay? So remember that. Now, the time period is also given in the first verse, if you look at it. It says the time or the period this story takes place is set for us, and it says it's at the time of the judges. Okay. If you're kind of confused by that or you're not too familiar with that period of Israel's history, it's okay. It's a period that we're going to flesh out a little bit more later, and it's where we're going to be spending the next couple weeks in that period. But to avoid wading in too deep right now, which I am always have the guilty tendency of doing, I want us to understand that during this time period, Israel, the people of God, were in a downward spiral that was caught in perpetual repeat. It's like they're going down, repeat, up, going down, repeat. It's a constant cycle. And if you read the book of Judges, there's a phrase that stands out in the book of Judges, which is very imperative to where we're looking at here. It says the people were doing what was right in their own eyes. The children of Israel, as recorded in the book we call Judges, again, begin this period of downward spiral where they will rebel against God and sin. And as a result of their sin and rebellion, God acts in judgment against these stiff-necked rebels who are just ignoring him. And then the people finally realize that they're sinning, so they cry out to God for repentance and plead for the Lord to help. And then the Lord, who is true to his gracious character, saves them. He saves them. This is the key theme of Scripture. This is one of them. Salvation through judgment. Salvation through judgment. God judges his people so they will return to him. So after reading the book of Judges, which we don't have to do, I'm giving you a little synopsis here, which is right before Ruth, we see a pattern. One, the people rebel. All right? Two, God sends judgment. Three, the people repent. Four, God saves. So there's a cycle, again, that's repeated again and again throughout that book. Now, the most common ways that we're going to see that God sends these judgments is going to be through the three horsemen of the apocalypse, which are war, pestilence, or famine, like we see here in our text, famine. So as noted in our narrative, famine is the judgment that God deploys. And so this is kind of where I want us to park, park, park right here before we get into our communion. This idea of famine. We can all probably think in our mind what famine is. We typically today do not experience true physical famine. 
In other words, at least not in the way that the ancient societies did. I mean, there may be times where we go hungry and there's not enough food for us individually. But, I mean, in an ancient Near East society, if you had a poor crop or no crop at all come in that year, or like I said, you're in a very poor season, that could mean death. It actually did mean death. Game over. No food grew this year. You're out of luck. That's famine. And that's what we need to see. The fear of famine, the fear of famine is a real thing. And the fear of famine brings the fear of death, which is the fourth horseman of the apocalypse that we see in Zechariah or Revelation. So famine is not just about hunger, which is bad enough, and those that probably skip breakfast this morning are kind of feeling a little uncomfortable, right? But famine is much more than just simple hunger. It's life or death. So when we see from our standpoint, and I want us to just go into Elimelech and Naomi's shoes here, we see from their standpoint that Elimelech and Naomi flee Bethlehem to Moab due to a famine. I mean, honestly, it makes logical sense, right? No food here, food there. No food here, food there. I think I'm going to go there. I'm hungry. I got a family to take care of. I'm going where there's food. I mean, that's just simple common sense, right? Everybody agrees, right? You got to go where there's food. But what we need to understand, this is a narrative, was recorded in Scripture not to teach us how to survive physical famine. This is not the, what is it, the bare grills of how to survive on your own with no food. This is not what this book is about. Because it seems like Elimelech had that figured out, self-preservation. This story, this narrative, what we have to understand is to teach us theology, not survival. Not survival in the physical world, but to teach us theology. This story is to teach us about God, about Yahweh, and how he operates. What we need to understand from a theological point is what Elimelech and Naomi did was not flee from disaster. They did not flee from famine because they had to, as we might assume from our modern way of thinking. What we need to see is they fled from God. And that's what this narrative is saying. They fled from God's land. And that's very important for us to understand. You see, they, like in our text, all of Bethlehem, were under the judgment of God. And ladies and gentlemen, in case you don't know, let me be clear, you can't flee the judgment of God. And I think our text reveals that to us. I mean, these first five verses of Ruth are crafted to show us that Elimelech and Naomi fled God in his judgment to get out of the city of Bethlehem, but they, like everybody else in Bethlehem, were sinners, and they were under a particular judgment. And this is a theological writing, and this is what we must understand. It's written primarily to teach us again about God, but it's also written to teach us about ourselves as well, because there are many times in our life that if we're honest, we kind of want to flee from God too when it's uncomfortable. When God's judgment comes, we kind of want to do what's right in our own eyes. What we need to see is Elimelech, Naomi, Malon, and Kilon were guilty. All of Bethlehem, as we get in the opening of this text, was guilty. Of what? Especially we are not told. And I know all you that are interested in, well, why were they guilty? What did they do? The text doesn't give us that. That's not the important part. The important part is not the sin. The important part is the response. And I think that goes for us too. The important part is how do we respond to sin? How do we respond to sin? When God brings judgment, how do we respond? Now, as we look on, we know uh, that they're under judgment because we see even though Elimelech and his family flee the physical famine, the physical judgment, it's clear from the narrative that they're still under God's judgment. And how do I know they're still under God's judgment? Well, again, look at your text. Look at verses 3 to 5. Look at how sad it was when Carrie was reading that statement. We see the men who fled judgment of God, the arm of the Lord, which, by the way, asked Jonah, it cannot be outrun. They all died. The men all perished in a foreign land, thinking that they could get away from God, thinking that they could survive without God. 
In some ways, like the prodigal son, or we could say the prodigal daughter here, the men all perish in a foreign land, and Naomi, the prodigal daughter, wakes up. And we see at the end of our text, she realizes the food of, for her in her life is back in Bethlehem. It's not in Moab. She must return to Moab, I mean, to Bethlehem. So what I want us to understand today, ladies and gentlemen, is as followers of God, we still rebel from God. You and I as followers of Jesus still ignore his word. We still sin, surprise. We still rebel. We still do, as Christians, what's right in our own eyes. Like Elimelech and his family, even though we are followers of Christ, we are still capable of rebellion. We are not above sinning. And if we do not confess our sin, repent, and submit to God, he will send judgment. And we can't, as we see in this text, outrun God. In our particular narrative, the judgment was physical famine. And when faced with God's judgment, Elimelech and Naomi took their family and fled to greener pastures. When, ladies and gentlemen, from looking at this, what they should have done when the famine came is fallen on their knees and repented to God and asked him to forgive them. But no, I can get through this on my own. I'll just go over there. I'll just go over there. I'll do what's right in my eyes. They should have begged for God's mercy. And ladies and gentlemen, that's why I, I bring us up to this whole idea of communion today. I don't know where you are today. Maybe you are in a great place with God. You're in a tove place with God. If so, praise the Lord. If you're in a good place where you're submitted to God's will and are hearing his teaching and heeding his instruction in every way, and you're following the Great Commission, and you're hospitable, then praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If you are, though, pray for me. Pray for the other people in this room, because if we're honest, we're all not so blessed. Because I can guarantee there are many of us in this congregation right now who have unconfessed sin. Or they won't get to their knees and beg for the Lord to show them mercy. Instead, they'll just stand in the judgment and say, I'm a Christian, I'm going to get through this. There are many of us who God is trying to speak to to get a hold of, but we, like Elimelech and Naomi, are doing what's right in our own eyes. And from Scripture, we can see that that's not good. And that's the sad truth of the book of Judges, and it's the sad truth of the modern church in America. We give lip service, but at the end of the day, we do what's right for this guy. Elimelech and Naomi, when they moved to Moab, we can deduce from the text, we're still living as Jews. They were still keeping many of the rituals, but not all of them. Likewise, we can have unconfessed sin in our life and be in rebellion to him and come to church and live as a Christian. We may fool ourselves. We may fool others. But we don't fool him. So if that's you today, repent. Throw yourself at the mercy of God, because as we see from the opening verse of this narrative, God's people go through judgment as well. And failure to repent could lead to great heartache. So what I want us to do right now, before we get into this majestic book of redemption, before we begin this study, I want us to prepare our hearts to make ourselves right with God as we prepare to take communion. I want us to give some time to talk to God and to prepare our hearts for communion. I want us to prepare ourselves before we take the bread down here. And I think, you see, because Jesus is, ladies and gentlemen, we all know it. He is the bread of life, correct? He is the answer to our famine. And ironically, ironically, and this is what we all have to catch right here. The name Bethlehem, you know the place where Jesus was born, Bethlehem? You, you, the place that Naomi and her husband Elimelech fled from and are returning to in this narrative? You know what the word Bethlehem means? House of bread. House of bread bread. Jesus, the bread of life, was born in the house of bread. Think about that for a moment. Elimelech and Naomi fled the house of bread to go get bread in Moab. But don't we do that, though? We flee the wisdom and the teachings and the community of God's word 
of Jesus looking for bread, for security, for something that's better for me. As followers of Christ, we must see the Lord always. As disciples of Christ, we must realize that He's in control. But equally important as this narrative lays out for us from the onset, just because you are a follower of Jesus does not mean you're not going to face famine or pestilence or even war. So the better question today as we prepare our hearts is, how do you respond to the judgments of God in your life? Are you doing what's right in your eyes, what's right for you? Are you fleeing for greener pastures at point in your life? If so, let my words this morning be instructive to you. Be like Naomi. Wake up. Wake up. Judgment will come to the house of the Lord as well. Repent. Turn back to Christ. Be like Naomi. Go back to Bethlehem. Return to the bread of life. Return to Jesus this morning. So after I pray this corporate prayer, prayer of confession, and they're going to pray, play the music, I want us to take a moment, each of us individually, to confess before God. Make yourself right before God. If there's something that you have not confessed to God that you need to confess, confess to the Lord today. Feed on Him, not on your own understanding. And then, after we take our communion, after we break bread, after we do this all together, after we sing a couple songs after communion, we give glory to God, we're going to return and begin unpacking three key themes of this text that will help us as we go through this text and hopefully help us to live our lives. But before we go into communion, before you come up and have a time of reflection, let's go to the Lord in a prayer of confession. Please bow your heads with me. Father, we come before you this morning. You are our maker, our provider, and our judge. Help us, Holy Spirit, to be conscious of our rebellion. Help us not to sit there in denial that we may have unconfessed sin before you. Let us be aware, mighty God, that it is you and you alone we sin against. Please help us be conscious of that fact. Let us realize that though you are our provider and our sustainer, For whatever reason, we reject you. Let us recognize that you, Jesus, are the only bread of life. Father, we confess that we are sinners. Honestly speaking, let us all realize that if disobedience makes the slightest offer of pleasure or comfort, we too often take it. We take the easy road. We head to Moab. And we have too often taken the easy road ignoring the promises of life that you have made for those who follow you. Lord, please forgive us. Please change us. Please, Lord, give us a new heart. Please change us that we might have hearts responsive to your word, that our hearts will be the good soil, not the rocky soil, the dried up ground, or the weed infested ground. Let our soil, our hearts be ready to take and nurture the gospel seed. Please change us. Please give us ears to hear that we will travel the narrow road, the road less travel. Let us return home to you, Jesus, to you, Father God, this morning. Please, Holy Spirit, remove all that stands before you and our worship of you this morning. Let us prepare our hearts for the Lord's Supper this morning. As the music plays, in Jesus' name, amen. Wow, thank you for letting us do something a little bit different. It was kind of interesting, huh? All right, good? Thank you to the praise team, and uh, as we continue our Bible study, have your book of Ruth out. We're diving right into it now. Uh, Today is also Reformation Day. Greg Bull came dressed correctly, so all of you afterward, if you don't know what Reformation Day is, you're going to have to have Greg give you a good lecture, right, Greg? Tell them what it is, so those that are confused. But happy Reformation Day to everybody. Happy Reformation Day. All right. As we begin, as we continue, uh, I have three main concepts that I want you guys to get today. So if you got a piece of paper, something to take notes on, take out your notes, write these down. These are three things which are going to help us through the rest of this book as we go through these next five, the rest of these four weeks after this. And uh, these three things are going to be able to, as you read through this text, are going to help you mine through some of the, the beauty that is the book of Ruth. And the first one of these three concepts 
is one that we talked about briefly is the time of judges. Now, real quickly, I'm going to give you all three. If you don't get the other two, it'll pop up on the screen later. But the three are the time of judges, the curse of the Moabites, sounds like a Star Wars sequel, and the road home, okay? So let's begin with the time of the judges. As I noted in our introduction, this book of Ruth takes place at some point in the period known as the time of the judges. A period when there was no human king in Israel. I think that's significant. A period when the 12 tribes of Israel, more or less, were kind of ruling themselves. Now, to be fair, the 12 tribes were supposed to be submitted to the true king, the true king Yahweh, the true king God, but they were given the Torah, the Bible, or the instruction that we have here, and, and were to be reared to meditate on this and to discern the way of God in their lives. That's what the Torah is. It's meditation literature. It's created for us to read, to meditate, to know what is the difference between Tov and Ra, which Adam and Eve failed at. It's there for us as followers of God to figure out how we are to live. But what we find out is that the people were no longer following the ways of Joshua and Caleb, it says. Their submission to God, their submission to God, their ability to step under God was more of an omission of God in their lives. You see, they said they were his people, good lip service, just like we say, I'm a Christian. But they were more or less doing their own thing. They were omitting the deeds that go with the words. I'm a Christian, but if I don't live like one, I'm omitting what I'm supposed to be doing. And that's something that I think we can all reflect on. Are we followers of Jesus, the King of Kings? Is he the king in our life? As we have the ability to determine what is good and bad for us from the scriptures, is Jesus king in our life? Are we submitting to his decree, or are we in omission as well, like the followers during this time. In Matthew 28, we see Jesus, the risen King of Kings, gives his command to make disciples of every nation. And so we got to reflect right away, are you doing that? Because clearly, at the time of Judges, they weren't. Are you participating in the great omission, which is, I'm going to say one thing, but I'm going to do the other, rather than the great commission? Because if you are, then I don't know if you've been paying attention, then you're primed for judgment. I'm just being honest here. You see, no submission leads to omission of God's will. However, submission to God, falling under God, giving Him control of your life, results in one fulfilling the great commission of God. So, we have to ask, are we actively making disciples? Are we actively ambassadors of Christ? Or are we just doing our own thing and saying, I'm a Christian? You see, God is jealous for his people. And he will bring in trials and judgment many times to provoke a response. And that's what we see in this early book in the, in the scripture, the book of Judges. This is very apparent. And as I said earlier, during this time period, the various tribes would go through a downward spiral. The people, maybe this is your own personal life too. You, the people rebel, I rebel. God sends judgment. God sends judgment. Something goes on. The people repent. I repent. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. And then God saves. And this is the storyline that we get, a big meta narrative, a big storyline that we see that comes through Scripture. But interestingly, if you read through Judges, it follows this pattern up until the last couple chapters. And then it goes, the people rebel. God sends judgment. And then what's missing in the last couple chapters is the people weren't repenting. But God still saves. Why does God still save? Because he is a gracious and loving God, hoping to get his people's attention. So as we continue through this narrative, it should be noted that there are no judges in this text of Ruth. There is no Gideon. There is no Samson. There is no Deborah. There are no listed judges coming in to save the people or uh, that we saw save the people during this text. But... It should be noted, as you write down, there are people in this narrative who see Yahweh as king. And that's what we need to do. We need to see Yahweh as king. And they submit to Yahweh. 
as king, even in the times of judgment. And one of the people in this, in this book who sees Yahweh as king is who the book's named after, Ruth. Ruth sees Yahweh as king, and she submits to Yahweh, and she follows his ways. She lives out the Torah. And that brings us to our second concept from this book, and this is one I want you to go with this, the curse of the Moabites. So write that down, the curse of the Moabites. You see, the irony here is, Ruth is a Moabite. She's not the Jew in the text that we see in the end of it. It's Naomi. Ruth is a Moabite. The Moabites, as I noted earlier, are a cursed people. A cursed people. So what does that mean? In Deuteronomy 23, write that down. You can look it up later. Deuteronomy 23. I'm giving you some homework here. You can find the curse handed down on the Moabites. It's a really an interesting story that has to do with Balaam. And again, we don't have time to go into it completely here, but I want to encourage you to do so this week as extra credit reading, give you a better insight on what this curse actually is and is about. Now, Deuteronomy 23 discusses the curse and how the Moabite curse will prevent them from entering the assembly of the Lord or the sacred space of God. In other words, they are not allowed in his presence. In other words, these people are barred from being part of the people of God due to their sin. Kind of like if you're a sinner, you're not supposed to take communion. If you don't confess before God, you're barred from it. And judgment, it says, Paul says, can't come upon you if you do not confess your sin. It's the same basic concept that we see here. And now, not to go without going into too much Levitical teaching here, we need to see the reason they were cursed. Now catch this with me. The reason they were cursed, the Moabite people, is because of a lack of hospitality to the people of God. Yes, a lack of hospitality? Really? They didn't let the people of God in. They didn't take care of the people of God in need. They... They just ignored the needs of the people of God. They weren't nice to the people of God. Yeah. Yeah. You see, when God's people were in trouble in the wilderness, the Moabites had the opportunity, as Lot's ancestors, to show love and hospitality to the children of Israel. But they refused to care for them. In fact, they wanted to curse them and cause all sorts of trouble. They turned their backs on the people of God. And that brought the curse. So perhaps we should take a moment of warning to us as well as I look at a text like this and I go, whoa, that's the curse? Hospitality? It should make us see that hospitality, ladies and gentlemen, is something God cares about. And the denial to help and to love and to take care of others who are followers of Christ, the, 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 the denial to let them into your lives and to care for them, Cause a curse of an entire nation. Then Moabites are not to be associated with the people of God in their community. And yet we see in our narrative, Elimelech and Naomi, you know, looking out for themselves, not only look for relief among the cursed people, they move into their community, kind of like Lot did with Sodom, and they marry their sons to their wives and the people in the community. I think it, our narrative makes it clear that Elimelech and his family trade the blessings of God and instead, you know, for those things cursed by God. The things which aren't any good, well, let's take those instead. They leave the land of promise, and this is what you need to write down. They leave the land of promise, the holy land, the land of promise, and they go to the land of compromise. Calm promise. Promise and compromise. And that's what we need to see here. As we as people, like Elimelech and Naomi, may think we can run from God, but you can't. You can't run from God. Interestingly, I want us to now turn our attention to Ruth. Notice as we study through the book that Ruth is one of these cursed people, these Moabites. She is a cursed person. Why are they naming a book in the Bible after a cursed people? Ruth is cursed, and yet... Ironically, as I mentioned earlier, she is one of the very few characters in this narrative who submit to Yahweh and see him as God, as king. And that's important for us to grasp onto. 
Ruth lives according to not what's right in her own eyes, not what's right in Moab's eyes, but according to what's right in God's eyes. And this is a key point. This is a key point. Ruth is about submission, not omission. So again, the cursed people in our story is the person who we see is, if we turn our Bible to Proverbs 31, is the best person in Scripture that exemplifies the Proverbs 31 woman. It's Ruth. She's hospitable. She's loving. She follows God. She takes care of her family. The person who is under the curse is the one who in all their ways submits to God. And this is important for us on many levels, and I'm going to give you two. Two reasons why it is important to see Ruth as a model follower of God. Two reasons why it's important to see Ruth as a model follower of God. And as you see them on the screen, first off, on one level, it gives us hope. I think this is the best one to see from the beginning. You see, just like Ruth, we as humanity are cursed by sin and death. Romans 5 tells us that. But just like Ruth, even if you are cursed, you and I, Gentiles, can submit to God, and through Christ, we can be recipients of the promise. We can give up the compromise, and we could be part of the promise. So seeing Ruth fulfill what the people of God couldn't do gives us hope. Gives us hope. The second one, we see Ruth as a picture of how we are to live. How we are to live. We all need to look at the life of Ruth, and we need to see this how we are to live. Ruth, unlike her cursed lineage, is very hospitable. She is very caring for the people of God because she follows God, and God has changed her. So much so, so that she leaves her homeland, leaves her comfort zone to take care of her mother-in-law. Now, remember, her mother-in-law is not wealthy. She's poor now. She's lost everything. And in society back then, if you did not have a husband and sons, you had no income, you had no means, you had nothing. It's just the, the tragedy of being a woman in ancient times. If no one was there to take care of you, you were left out alone. Now, supposedly a hospitable community like Israel would take care of you. But what we see here is she's taken care of or intended to be taken care of by a cursed person. There are many reasons not to stick with Naomi. Ruth, Ruth should leave. By all practical purposes, Ruth should get out of here. I should not uh, chain myself to Naomi here because first off, her mother-in-law is a different nationality. A nationality which, by the way, which I'm sure caused some problems when they lived in Moab, calls the Moabites a cursed people. So you're chaining yourself to somebody who calls your type of people a cursed people. That can't be good. Second, her mother-in-law is, like I said, has poor and has no means. Third, her mother-in-law, who, as we will see, actually tells her not to come. We'll see that next week. She's actually very rude, very rude, and ignores her when she does decide to come all the way into Bethlehem, and she ignores her when she gets there. So she's not like this great mother-in-law. She's a very rude and mean and bitter mother-in-law. And four, what we have to understand, we see through it as this plays out, Ruth is still young enough to remarry. Naomi's done. She's got nothing. She's done. But Ruth, she still has a chance. She ditches Naomi. She can stay around. She can get remarried, have kids, be taken care of, and still have a great life, maybe a good family. And I think that's important for us to understand. The grass is only greener on the side of promise. It may not look like it, but everything that Ruth gives away over here to attach herself to Naomi and to follow and submit to God, oh, it plays out. Maybe not in her generation, but we know Jesus comes from her line. We know David comes from her line. And this is what we need to see. Just because it looks bleak, it's better to be in the valley of the shadow of death with God on your side than to be chilling and relaxing in the land of compromise. Ruth knew this. And as we follow Ruth through, we're going to see Ruth continues to submit to God. Ruth, by submitting to Yahweh and Naomi in a worldly viewpoint, is foolish. But as we're going to see, Ruth believes 
the words of God. She meditates on the words of God. Ruth, by faith, submits to God, in contrast to Elimelech and Naomi, who had no faith and who fled. You see, in Ruth, ladies and gentlemen, we see a person who lives by Yahweh's words and for Yahweh's people. She's hospitable. She takes care of a cantankerous old woman who wants nothing to do with her and offers her no benefits. Ruth is totally submitting to the calling of God has on her lives and on his people. Ruth is a model for us in the Christian life. And this is such an important thing that we need to grasp as we continue to follow Ruth throughout this text. You see, Ruth, the cursed Moabite, is submitted to God. And then our third point, the road home. The road home. There's a saying. You probably heard it. I guarantee you've heard it. You can never go home again. Who's heard that saying? You can never go home again. It's a saying. It's a literature. It's literature. Well, thankfully for us, as we see illustrated in the parable of the prodigal son, as well as here in the parable of the prodigal daughter, the story of Naomi, here in the book of Ruth, you can see you can go home again. And you should go home again. That saying is completely wrong from a theological standpoint. You should go home again. You should go back to the Father who created all things. You should return to Jesus. You should return to the Father. That's what we're called to do. We are called to go home. We see in the opening of her narrative, the redemption of Naomi begins when she returns home to the house of bread. She's going back to where there's food. And we see, surprisingly, you're going to see next week that that whatever the famine is gone, every, the people have repented and everything's going great, except for Naomi. Naomi returns to the house of bread. You see, Naomi and Elimelech thought they could do it on their own, but they were wrong. The redemption of Naomi is center of this narrative. The book of Ruth, we, we sometimes think is the story of Ruth, but really, it's the redemption of Naomi. Naomi is the focus. She's who we're centered on as we follow through here. The book of Ruth is the story of redemption, the return of one of God's people. In this case, it's Naomi, a person who rejected God. Likewise, we need to see that we as fallen humanity, like Naomi, must return. Now, interestingly, because i got to give you some of these geek facts, the Hebrew word used here in Ruth for return, shuv, shuv, is the same word for repent. Return equals repent. So think about that for a moment. Every time you're reading through here and you see the word return, you could just stick the word repent in there because it's the exact same word in Hebrew. You've got to love the Hebrew language. They were so focused on certain things. We in our English, we pull things away. But the whole idea to return is to repent. We need to return home. We need to repent and go home. And so to return to God is to repent. And this is what we see the beginning here with Naomi. The structure is pushing for her. Repentance has begun. It's not going to be quiet right away. It's going, to see, it's going to take some time for Naomi to get right with the Lord. But this is the journey that we're embarking on. To return home is to return to the kingdom ideal. To return to the Edenic ideal. To return to the promise. To return what was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's where we need to go. The kingdom created for Christ. The kingdom that he created for us if we follow him. And we go through our journey. So in closing today, maybe you're a Naomi here today. I've been a Naomi before. Maybe you've fled from God's way. Maybe you've been trying to live your life on your own by your own rules and just giving lip service to the King of Kings. You're still doing what's right in your own eyes. Maybe you are closed your doors of hospitality to other believers. Maybe you don't know other believers in. Oh, no, this, this is mine. It's America. It's mine. Mine. Stay out. Mm, that's not biblical. We need to be open to others. Maybe you're not letting others into your life, or maybe you're not trying to get into other people's lives. If that's you, let me encourage you to repent, return, come home. The ideals of the world are different than the ideals of the land of promise. We need to go to the promise. We need to seek the promise.
If that's you, let me encourage you again. Repent, return, come home. God is there for you. If you're here today, and maybe you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please come home. If you don't know what that entails, please come see me after the church service day or Pastor Dan or Pastor Jonathan or anybody. Come home. Jesus is home. Jesus is life. He is the bread of life. We sign the covenant with that he signed with his blood and we live that life. That's what the Christian life is to be. Let us not forget this passage is shaped to address us, you and me as a people who are just like Elimelech and Naomi. It was too late for Elimelech, but as we're going to see, it's not too late for Naomi. Like them, we often find the grass greener on the fields of Moab. Brothers and sisters, you got two options. This is what it comes down to today. It all boils down to this. you got two options. Choose the promise. Choose the promise. Or choose the compromise. That's the Christian life. Live the promise. Or say you live the promise. But really live the compromise. Choose the bread of life. Not the stale bread of Moab. Not the cursed bread. Choose life. Choose the bread of life. And because the beautiful part is we're going to go through this study, Ruth chooses the bread of life. And there's really no earthly reason why she should. She did because she, the cursed Moabite, was willing to submit everything to the true king. I pray, my prayer for us as we go through this is we strive to emulate Ruth as she emulates Christ. If you've never read Proverbs 31, please read Proverbs 31 and realize that in the Jewish order of the canon, when they put their Bible together in the mass, one of the Masoretic texts, they put the book of Ruth not after Judges. They put it after the book of Proverbs. So you finish with the Proverbs 31 woman, and then you roll right into Ruth, the person who lived it. That's who we need to live. Let's think on this this week. Let us be Ruth. Let's, close our, let's, let's bow our heads and pray as we close.